Hello and welcome to another complete OCR GCS EPE lesson where you'll learn absolutely everything you need to know on topic 2.2 applying the principles of training. As always we'll be following the OCR syllabus exactly and we'll cover absolutely everything you need to know for your final exam. For topic 2.2 you need to know about the principles of training, the principles of overload, the different types or methods of training and the key components and physical benefits of warming up and cooling down. Before we begin, I'd really appreciate it if you'd take a moment to click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to be notified when the next topic is uploaded. We'll begin with the names and definitions of the principles of training, which are a set of guidelines that an individual must follow if they want the best results from their training. The first is specificity, which states that the type of training undertaken should be relevant to the sport being prepared for. For example, a marathon runner should use more endurance training since their sport is predominantly aerobic in nature, a high jumper could use plyometric training as their event relies on power, and a cyclist might use weight training to develop the muscular endurance of their quadriceps. Overload refers to the need to work the body beyond its current limits so that it's forced to adapt to the new demands. This can be achieved by increasing the frequency, intensity or duration of training sessions. For example, the resistance or number of repetitions per set when weight training. Progression refers to the need for overload to be continually applied. Once the body has adapted to a certain level of demand, the level must again be raised if further improvements are to be made. It's important that progression is gradual, as pushing the body too hard too soon may result in injury or overtraining. The principle of reversibility states that training effects are reversible and that fitness benefits will be lost if training intensity falls or breaks from training are taken. For example, a rugby player who's unable to train due to injury will experience atrophy or a reduction in muscle mass. Okay, so that's everything you need to know on the principles of training, so we'll move on to the next section titled Optimizing Training. We'll begin with the names and definitions of the principles of overload, which can easily be remembered using the acronym FIT. The F stands for frequency, which refers to how often you train. Overload can be achieved by increasing the frequency of training, for example, progressing from two to three weight training sessions per week. How often a performer should train is dictated by several factors, including their ability and fitness level and the type of training being used. For example, longer recovery intervals may be required between weight training sessions than between continuous training sessions. The I stands for intensity, which refers to the level of physical demand. Progression can be achieved by gradually working harder over time, for example by increasing the resistance, reps or pace, or reducing rest periods between sets. When setting training intensity, the fitness level of the performer and type of training being used should both be taken into account. The first T stands for time, or how long training sessions last for, and progression can be achieved by gradually increasing duration over time. When setting duration, intensity must be considered, as certain types of training require longer than others to be effective. The other T stands for the type of training, which must be considered if the specific needs of a performer are to be fulfilled. For example, a sprinter might use high intensity interval training to develop anaerobic fitness and speed, while a long distance cyclist would benefit more from aerobic training methods. Next, you need to know about several different methods of training, the first of which is continuous training. Continuous training typically involves performing large compound movements like running, cycling or swimming continuously or without rest periods. Continuous training can increase the size and contractile strength of the heart, leading to improvements in stroke volume and cardiac output and therefore cardiovascular endurance or stamina. Continuous training should be sustained for a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes if it's to be effective and heart rate should be maintained above 60% of maximum heart rate throughout. Fartlek training is another form of continuous training as no rest periods are taken. Fartlek means speed play and is characterized by variations in pace and or terrain. A typical fartlek circuit may include sections for walking, jogging, sprinting and hill climbs and therefore targets both aerobic and anaerobic fitness components. 
It's a more varied and enjoyable training method than continuous training and is particularly beneficial for team sports that involve both long periods of moderate activity and intermittent high intensity bursts. Interval training involves periods of work interspersed by periods of rest and can be adapted to improve both aerobic and anaerobic fitness components. Aerobic interval training involves longer work and shorter rest periods, while anaerobic interval training involves short intervals of high intensity work with longer rest periods between each. There are several different types of interval training, including circuit training, weight training, plyometric training, and high intensity interval training. Circuit training is an extremely versatile method of training as a range of different exercises are combined in a single workout. A typical circuit training session may include six to 10 stations and participants stay on a given station either for a set period of time or until they complete a predetermined number of repetitions. Once done, participants transition to the next station and repeat the process until the session is complete. It's important to ensure that consecutive exercises target different muscle groups so that intensity and form can be maintained. In addition, skill-based stations can also be incorporated, making circuit training an excellent choice for team sport athletes. Weight training uses external weights as a resistance to work against. For a given exercise, someone using weight training will typically perform several sets of consecutive repetitions with rest periods between each. Weight training can be used to target several fitness components, including strength, muscular endurance, and power. Those who wish to target strength should lift more weight but complete fewer repetitions per set, for example, three sets of five reps at 85% of their one repetition maximum. Those focused on muscular endurance should increase the number of reps per set and reduce the weight accordingly, for example, three sets of 12 repetitions at 70% of their one rep max. Plyometric training involves performing explosive exercises where the muscles rapidly lengthen and shorten. It's specifically intended to improve power or the ability to apply lots of force over an extremely short period of time. Exercises like squat jumps, bounds and depth jumps require muscles to work concentrically when jumping and eccentrically upon landing. The final training method that you need to know is high intensity interval training or HIT for short. HIT involves brief intensive work periods that last anywhere from 8 to 10 seconds to several minutes, with time in between for rest and recovery. Recovery intervals are typically far longer than work intervals, which is important as they allow time for lactic acid to be removed and intensity to be maintained. Okay, so that's everything that you need to know on the methods of training, so we'll move on to look at the phases and physical benefits of a warm-up. The first phase is the pulse raiser, which involves performing whole body exercises like jogging, cycling or swimming to gradually increase heart rate and breathing rate. This increases blood flow and oxygen delivery to the muscles and speeds up the removal of waste products like carbon dioxide. In addition, the muscles become warmer and more flexible, reducing the risk of sustaining an injury. Next, mobility exercises that carry joints through their full range of motion. Movements like arm swings, heel flicks and high knees engage the muscles and prepare the joints for action. Stretching is the third phase and stretches should be dynamic in most cases, centered around the movement patterns used in the activity being prepared for. Although static stretching is an effective way of training flexibility, it should generally be avoided during a warm-up as it can lead to a reduction in explosive power. Stretching increases the pliability of muscles, tendons and ligaments and the range of movement possible at joints. The next phase consists of dynamic movements like shuttle runs that involve changes in speed and direction. Dynamic movements prepare the body for the physical demands of exercise and increase the speed with which muscles contract. Finally, performers should practice or rehearse the skills and movement patterns they are about to perform. For example, a tennis player practices ground strokes, serves and volleys before a game. Okay, so that's everything you need to know on warming up, so we'll move on to look at the phases and physical benefits of a cooldown. 
An effective cool down consists of two phases, beginning with a period of low intensity exercise, like jogging, walking or cycling, where pace is reduced gradually throughout. This helps the body transition back to its resting state and allows heart rate and breathing rate to fall gradually. This ensures that blood flow and oxygen delivery are maintained for some time, which allows lactic acid to be oxidized and removed and prevents blood pooling in the veins. If blood pressure falls too rapidly after exercise, blood may collect above the pocket valves, but by maintaining blood flow, this issue is avoided. The second phase involves stretching the muscles, and during a cool down, static stretches like a hamstring stretch are typically used. This serves to lengthen the muscle fibres, reducing stiffness later on, and helps to maintain blood flow, which speeds up the removal of lactic acid and limits the effects of DOMS. DOMS stands for Delayed Onset Muscle Soreness, and tends to peak somewhere between 24 and 48 hours after exercise. Well done, you've just covered absolutely everything you need to know on topic 2.2, applying the principles of training. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate your subscription, and I'll see you next time for topic 2.3, preventing injury in physical activity and training.